COVID-19 restrictions have been lifted nearly everywhere around the, gro the globe, but the lingering effects of the virus remind us that it has by no means gone away. We're going to share the latest pandemic impact and the dog days of summer have officially arrived. This time of year, it's critically important to remember that overexposure to the sun could carry dangerous and lasting side effects. We're going to discuss how to maximize your protection against sun damage and potentially lethal skin cancer. Good evening and welcome to Rural Health Matters. We are so glad you've joined us tonight. I'm Christina Loren. Joining us, as always, Dr. Jeffrey Gold, the Chancellor of the University of Nebraska Medical Center. And tonight, a little bit later on, Dr. Ashley Wysong, the founding chair of the UNMC Department of Dermatology, will be our special guest. And we're going to be talking about skin cancer in depth tonight. We want to hear from you. But Dr. Gold, first... Thank you so much for joining us. I know our viewers are looking forward to asking their questions. What are we starting with tonight? Sure. Well, certainly it's great to be with you, and I hope that our audience had a really enjoyable and safe Fourth of July holiday. Uh, I know uh, the weather was kind of challenging, and that's one of the reasons we're talking about sun damage tonight and the risks of skin cancer. But COVID is getting better, and it's pretty much in the rearview mirror in most of our lives, but not completely. So let's just take a look and see what the most recent trends have been. And of course, starting off uh, with our first graphic that looks at hospitalization uh, in the United States, the overall hospitalization rate is well under uh, one per 100,000. It's about 0.6 per 100,000. Uh, and indeed, the uh, hospitalizations are just over 2,000 in the United States. If you say that quickly, compared to the tens of thousands and hundreds of thousands that we saw over the last several years, uh, these numbers are far more favorable. There's still a good deal of variability. You see Delaware, Missouri, Arizona, North Carolina, Pennsylvania still are higher than the U.S. average, anywhere from almost 10 times to twice the U.S. average. However, these are extremely small numbers, uh, ranging from about 55 to about 160. Uh, but it just makes the point that COVID is still with us. It still fills hospital beds. And indeed, the older population that are most vulnerable and the very young population uh, with multiple medical comorbidities, those that are being treated for cancer or other diseases, are still very much uh, at risk for COVID. If you look at the uh, trends of hospitalization, again, <clears throat> all moving in the right direction. Overall, in the light gray line, hospitalization is down. ICU stays are pretty well down. Uh, they're not quite down to baseline uh, and certainly not zero. But 2000 beats the heck out of, you know, you remember back to our early 2022, we had about 150,000 Americans hospitalized. Uh, at that time. A dramatic change. And certainly we want to be very sure as we get into the fall season, as the weather starts to change, and as we go back to school, that we don't repeat any of that. If you look at hospitalizations by age, uh, again, uh, the, even the 70-year age and older group <clears throat> and the 60 to 69-year group, uh, which are the two highest components because of the highest risk of COVID hospitalization, Again, continue to fall at a very good rate. And hopefully by the time we get into the fall season, those numbers will be even lower. Again, if you look at the 14-day running average, we're down almost 40%. And as I said a few minutes ago, just over 2,000 hospitalizations, but well down. <clears throat> hopefully that is not an artifact of reporting over the 4th of July holidays. We'll see in the next week or two whether this trend is sustainable and really is the good news that we thought it is. Now, there are changes in the COVID variant distribution, and I'd like to bring this to your attention. Every week, we look at the so-called NowCast model, and you see there in uh, orange the EG5 uh, subtype, uh, which is uh, XBB 1.5.10, as it's called. And that does seem to be the most rapidly growing segment of the COVID variants. This is an Omicron 
subtype. It is highly, highly contagious, does cause hospitalization, and right now it is spreading widely across the United States. If you look at the map of our nation, you can see those orange sectors are now present in significant percentage in every single sector of the uh, of the U.S., particularly uh, uh, in the Northeast and in the Mid-Atlantic, uh, but even in the Pacific Northwest and in the southwest part of the country, uh, in the southeast, in the Great Lakes region, and even in our home area here uh, in Region 7. And this is just outcompeting because it is far more effective than even the earlier Omicron variants that we tracked across the United States. And it's a very significant genetic pattern uh, of difference. If you look at overall uh, weekly COVID mortality, numbers continue to fall. Uh, some of this is probably reporting, but overall the trends have been in the right direction. Uh, if you look at uh, U.S., we're at about 0.2 per 100,000 deaths uh, weekly. 736 people lost their lives to COVID. That's confirmed. Numbers, <clears throat> as you see, New Mexico, Nebraska, Arkansas, Oklahoma and Iowa, all very small, double-digit numbers <clears throat> ranging from 10 to 18 deaths. So very, very small numbers uh, per 100,000. And again, very importantly in what we track here uh, is the seasonal uh, viral pneumonia mortality uh, trends. And as you can see in the red curve uh, on the right side of your screen, that red curve has really uh, very solidly approached uh, the black waving line. And so what that means is that the overall viral pneumonia mortality, young and old, uh, rural and urban, uh, has reached a baseline level. Now, obviously, we'd like to get that wavy line uh, to be even lower and to decrease that due to use of our vaccines. And we'll talk a bit more about that in a few minutes. However, uh, the trends, again, have been extremely positive, uh, extremely favorable. If you look at the overall vaccine rates uh, in the U.S., uh, you can see that both for primary sequences and also for uh, people getting boosted, the numbers are extremely low. I think right now uh, most of America is waiting to see what the Food and Drug Administration, uh, the uh, Antimicrobial Rec Committee recommendations, as well as the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention are going to be rolling out the final decisions as to which variant subtypes, whether or not they'll be combined with influenza. Again, uh, we talked earlier, a major push on the use of RSV or respiratory syncytial virus vaccines for this fall for those 65 and older will be a major step forward to reduce hospitalization and reduce death uh, due to seasonal viral pneumonias. Uh, all good news, and uh, again, we're going to be spending a lot of time in the future uh, talking about which vaccines are available and what the recommendations are for our farmers and ranchers uh, across the country and what the best timing should be. So as Christina said, the subject of our discussions tonight are skin cancer in rural America. And just to set the stage before we introduce Dr. Wysong, I have a few points that I'd like to make. Uh, this chart uh, looks at both age and time trends. And what it tells us is that the older you are, the higher your chances are of getting skin cancer. And that over time, over the last 20 years, the incidence of skin cancer, the diagnosis of skin cancer, has gone up in all age groups but particularly in the over 65 age group and in the 50 to 65 year age group and even in the younger age groups. And that skin cancer is the single most common cancer in the United States and it, the rising number of incidents is actually staggering. Some of that is due to exposure. Some of that is due to aging of our population. Some of that is due to better diagnosis. Uh, again, most people are diagnosed with skin cancer, more people are diagnosed with skin cancer each year than all of the other types of cancer combined. I'll say that again. There are more people diagnosed each year with skin cancer than all of the other types of cancer combined. And we've spent a lot of time on this show talking about breast cancer and colon cancer and pancreas cancer and lung cancer, and we'll be spending more in the future 
but this puts the complications of skin cancer into a perspective for us. And that, unfortunately, many of the viewers of our broadcast, our farmers, livestock producers, and the agricultural industry personnel, are a part of the core of the skin cancer statistics. And that's related, of course, to lots of outdoor work, uh, consistently uh, uh, ranking the highest in the overall outside sun exposure. And we all know that, that farmers are one of the most high-risk skin cancer categories. And that's, of course, because most of our farmers and ranchers work in the direct sunlight, often seven days a week, and often at the sunniest times of the day. And many of them, unfortunately, do not use an adequate amount of sun protection. And we're going to unpack that extensively with Dr. Weisong in just a few minutes. Most of the cases of skin cancer, as we said a few minutes ago, are due to overexposure of sunlight and particularly due to ultraviolet rays from the sun. Uh, also due to tanning beds, sun lamps, uh, etc. And these ultraviolet rays and one or two particular types of ultraviolet rays are the most damaging. In the short term, uh, this damage can cause what you and I would refer to as sunburn. But over time, that ultraviolet damage uh, adds up and it leads to significant changes in the texture of our skin, premature aging, and unfortunately, as we're going to unpack in just a few minutes, whether it's squamous, uh, basal, or melanoma, different types of skin cancer, each of which have different diagnoses uh, and different treatment. So the basal and the squamous cell cancers are the two most common types of skin cancers. I'm sure many of us can say that either ourselves or a family member have been treated for one of these more common types. They begin uh, in the basal and squamous layers of the skin. These are the upper layers of the skin. And both can usually be cured, uh, but they can be disfiguring. <clears throat> they can be difficult to treat. And sometimes they can actually spread to other organs and be the cause of death. And many people don't appreciate that. However, melanoma, uh, the cancer of the pigment-producing part of our skin, is the third and the most common type of skin cancer. Uh, it begins in the cells that are called melanocytes. And of all of the skin cancer, melanoma causes the most death because of its tendency to spread to other parts of the body, including vital organs uh, and other areas uh, in the skin. And indeed, uh, that is the one that we are the most cautious about, and that is also all three of these uh, related to ultraviolet radiation. You know, if you look at the uh, overall trends by age and gender, uh, the blue being the male and the orange being female, uh, you can see that uh, the skin cancer diagnoses peak uh, in the 60s, 70s, and 80s, and then as people get older, the number of diagnoses uh, actually appear uh, in the U.S. Uh, to be uh, dropping. So what are we looking for? What are our dermatologists looking for? And most importantly, what you should be looking for at home? You should be looking for the asymmetrical, not perfectly round mole or spot, but one that's irregular in shape with a border uh, that is jagged. Uh, color would be uneven. Uh, the diameter or the size of the spot uh, <clears throat> should be, you know, if it's of concern is certainly larger than a P or changing. And most importantly, any mole, any spot, any lesion on our skin that appears to have changed over the last weeks or months is one that's worth having somebody to look at and possibly worth uh, getting a quick biopsy on just to make absolutely sure. So believe it or not, these actually spell A, B, C, D, and E, asymmetrical border color diameter and evolving in size or in shape makes it just a bit easier uh, for all of us uh, to remember. You know, if you go back to the year 2000 and you look at diagnosis of skin cancer in rural America per 100,000 population, and you compare that to the year 2020, when with the last year we had solid data, you can see a dramatic change in the diagnosis. And I believe, and we'll ask Dr. Weisong about this in a few minutes, 
that we're doing a better job of diagnosing it. I think people are more aware of the A, B, C, Ds, and Es of changes uh, in their skin lesions. They're coming to see a physician or a health professional earlier on, and there's just more awareness and better diagnosis. But there's still a tremendous amount of UV light exposure. And indeed, you know, if there's anything we learned during the pandemic, it was that being outdoors was safer and healthier to reduce viral spread. But that same phenomenon of being outdoors increases sun exposure and increases UV radiation exposure from sunshine. And in the absence of adequate sunscreen, uh, hats, gloves, protective equipment, long sleeve garments, particularly for our farmers and ranchers, uh, we're dealing with quite a bit of concern uh, as to what that exposure may be. So I am not all that optimistic of what the next several years is going to look like in terms of the number of diagnoses. Now, as I said earlier, there are many different types of ultraviolet radiation. They're known as UVA, UVB, and UVC. There are several other subtypes as well. However, the UVA type is more associated with the aging and drying of our skin. And unfortunately, the UVB type is associated with the sunburn and is associated with the propensity uh, to skin cancer. And therefore, the UV index, which forecasts the strength of ultraviolet rays each day, is critically important. And any UV index that is three or higher in your home community, in your area, means that you need to be protecting your skin uh, from too much exposure uh, to the sun. And then finally, uh, you know, the CDC recommends several ways uh, to protect your skin uh, when the UV index is high. And the centers of disease control, of course, say, stay in the shade. Well, that's not so easy for our farmers and ranchers to wear clothing that covers your arms and legs to wear a hat with a wide brim and to wear it constantly. Shade your face, your head, your ears, uh, and your neck whenever you can. Uh, to wear sunglasses uh, that wrap around uh, and block both UVA and UVB uh, types of radiation. And then very, very importantly, to use broad spectrum sunscreen uh, with sun protection factor of at least 15, and what we're going to hear from Dr. Wysong in a few minutes, I hope that maybe even higher would be a better recommendation. Wow. And so that's the message for tonight, Christina, uh, and I very much look forward to bringing Dr. Wysong into our conversation, and most importantly, of course, for our audience to ask their questions about how they can be best protected against them with this most common type of cancer, skin cancer. Absolutely. 877-731-6733. We also encourage you to share your stories because sometimes it takes us hearing from another person what they had to go through before we make any key decisions in our own lives. So please share your stories with us. Maybe you have a family member, you yourself, had to undergo treatment for skin cancer. We'd love to hear from you tonight. You know, it's tough, Dr. Gold, because we think about the sun, we think about vitamin D, some of the benefits that we do get from the sun. How do you know when you're overdoing it? What are some of the key markers of when you've had too much sun? Well, certainly that is a great question for Dr. Wysong, but the, the dryness, <clears throat> the... Uh, time of exposure, the UV density on a given day. You know, I, I guess the best message that I would transmit to our audience and one that I follow and I try to get my kids and my grandkids and my friends and family members to do, when in doubt, be covered. You know, wear a hat, uh, long sleeve garments if you're going to be out for a long time. And that's hard, particularly, you know, if you're going to be in the pool or out at the pond or the lake and you're going to be boating or fishing or working uh, on the farm or uh, in cattle production, use that sunscreen and use it several times a day. And, you know, get something with an SPF that's probably closer to 25 or 30 uh, if you possibly can. And, uh, and I know that there's a lot of concern about that. It's a bother to have to carry that stuff with you and to always remember. 
but you know, I'll tell you, I'm very proud of my kids and my uh, and the way they handle my grandkids. I mean, I never see them outside on a sunny day uh, when they're riding their bikes or they're swimming or whatever uh, without you know adequate sunscreen, and certainly when possible with a hat, when possible with uh, with long sleeves. And while there are no guarantees. You know, all of us have probably had a friend or a family member that's been treated for skin cancer, particularly even possibly for melanoma, which is the most serious type. And uh, you get an appreciation for how life-threatening that can be extremely quickly. And uh, it gives you a great deal of concern, and hopefully that results in maximum protection. I mean, the good news here, Christina, is we can protect against these most common types of skin cancer by taking care of ourselves. Uh, that's not true for every type of cancer. There are, unfortunately, many types of cancer that are far more genetically linked or have to do with other types of environmental exposures that we don't have control over. But this is one where we've got a great deal of, of potential for control. So that's why it's so important, and that's why we're making these points with our audience this evening. Absolutely. I mean, there's so many factors going into agriculture. If you're going to be out there working in the sun, we're talking about chemicals for farmers. We're talking about dust, particulate matter. And this is just yet another obstacle that we want to make sure that you're aware of protecting yourself from. We want you to have the safest, healthiest, longest life possible. So we're going to dive into this conversation and take your input after the break. We want to hear from you tonight. The number is 877 731 Six seven three three. Give us a call. What are your questions about skin cancer? How do you prevent it? Or maybe you have a story to share with us. We're going to be back with more on the other side of this break. Stay with us. Eight seven 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 three one six seven three three. And when we come back, Dr. Ashley Wysong will join the conversation. Stay with us. More rural health matters after this. The 2023 NFR is only six months away. It's not too early to book your stay at the Cowboy Channel Host Hotel and Headquarters for all the excitement. Resorts World sold out last year by late summer, so don't wait. Resorts World is the perfect location for all the action. Tesla rides to Cowboy Christmas, live Western sports roundup shows every morning, post show every night. All your favorite cowboys and cowgirls are staying there as well as all your favorite Cowboy Channel personalities. Use the special promotion code and book your room today before prices increase or rooms sell out. We can't wait to see you and all your friends at Resorts World for the 2023 NFR from Las Vegas. So don't miss this great opportunity and come stay at the Cowboy Channel's Hotel, Resorts World Las Vegas. Give the gift of rodeo with the best present around. The Cowboy Channel Plus gift card. 950 live rodeo performances, including the 2023 Wrangler NFR. Go to CowboyChannelPlus.com slash gift and sign up for a full year of pro rodeo for only $119.99. Get more bang for your bucks with Cowboy Channel Plus. Whether you're a farmer, rancher, or simply someone who enjoys the rural way of life, Rural Radio Channel 147 connects you to rural America and Canada at the new RuralRadio147.com. Visit our improved website and view our programming schedules, listen to samples of our shows, and leave us a voice message for a chance to be heard on air. Your agribusiness and western lifestyle channel with a new and improved user experience at RuralRadio147.com. Welcome back to Rural Health Matters. I'm Christina Loren. Joining us once again, world-renowned Dr. Jeffrey Gold, the Chancellor of the University of Nebraska Medical Center. And now we welcome Dr. Ashley Wysong. She's the founding chair and William W. Bruce, MD, distinguished chair of the UNMC Department of Dermatology. She is a nationally recognized Mohs micrographic surgeon, a translational skin cancer researcher, and a dedicated educator and mentor. Dr. Wysong serves as the director of the Skin Cancer Program at the Fred and Pamela Buffett Cancer Center at UNMC. 
We welcome you with open arms tonight, Dr. Weisong. This is such a critically important topic for our audience. And we understand that you recently published an article in the New England Journal of Medicine about squamous cell carcinoma of the skin. Tell us a little bit more about that report to start. Yeah, absolutely, Christina. Thank you so much to you and to Dr. Gold and all the viewers for having me on tonight to really highlight skin cancer. And Dr. Gold did an outstanding job of, of really introducing us to everything we need to know about skin cancer. I uh, had the honor to recently publish a review article on squamous cell carcinoma of the skin for the New England Journal of Medicine. And it has a large readership really across the, the globe. And I was very, very honored to have that opportunity to really review the best and latest, most up-to-date treatments, diagnostic factors, as well as ways that we can prevent skin cancer. And it's really able to bring some, shed some light on what we can do to help fight these very common types of cancer. You know, it's scary because all of us just want to get out there, get the job done. But when you have that certain threat from the sun, there are definitely some precautions that need to be taken. We understand that squamous cell carcinoma is one of the most common cancers in humans, outnumbering the top five reportable cancers treated in the United States, breast, lung, prostate, colorectal, and melanoma. How dangerous is it? Yeah, great question. And, you know, as Dr. Gold mentioned, squamous cell carcinoma is the second most common skin cancer. We treat over 1 million squamous cell carcinomas a year in the United States. And the good news is the vast majority are very highly curable in your local physician's office under just local anesthesia and very highly curable. About three to 5% can actually go outside of the skin to other parts of the body when it will rapidly become life-threatening. However, again, the vast majority are really curable with local treatment in the clinics alone. Now, is our annual checkup with our regular doctor good enough mm -hmm. to keep an eye out for the signs of skin cancers, or do we need more specialized care? How do you know when you might be dealing with melanoma? Yeah, fantastic question. And medicine is absolutely a team sport. And as dermatologists, we depend on our partners on the front lines, our primary care physicians, our advanced practice providers to really be our first line of defense for finding skin cancer. In addition, patients themselves and loved ones can do a phenomenal job of early diagnosis of skin cancer. And so it's amazing how many skin cancers are found by significant others or just loved ones who happen to notice something that's not able to be seen by the patient alone. Now, what about patients that should actually be seen a board certified dermatologist on a regular basis? The reality is dermatologists make up less than 1% of physicians. And as Dr. Gold mentioned, we really have a shortage of specialists across the country. And in terms of who should be seeing a board certified dermatologist for regular skin checks, we typically would counsel anyone with a personal or family history of skin cancer, patients who might have an abnormal immune system that could put them at higher risk for skin cancer, such as organ transplant patients or other patients that are on medications that impact the immune system. Patients with a high number of moles or atypical moles, or really, as Dr. Gold mentioned, anyone with a new, growing, bleeding, or otherwise concerning skin lesion that might meet those A, B, C, D, E criteria that were discussed earlier. Those are typically the types of patients that we would encourage to see a dermatologist uh, and again, we really depend on all of our finish, physicians and clinician partners across the country, uh, and particularly in rural America, to be our uh, frontline partners. Absolutely. Interesting that we're talking about skin cancer, the single most common cancer in the U.S., and you said that less than 1% are dermatologists out there. That's, that's hard to reconcile when you think about it. Many in our audience, they may work outside Maybe they've done so for years and they feel like they've built up a tolerance for the sun as a result. 
What do you say to that person? And are some of us more susceptible than others to burns and skin cancer? Outstanding question, Christina. So I always say there's no such thing as a safe tan. Now, that being said, um, we know that there are certain patterns of ultraviolet exposure that put patients at higher risk in general for skin cancer. So for non-melanoma skin cancers like basal cell and squamous cell carcinoma, we find that it's really the cumulative and total lifetime exposure to ultraviolet radiation that puts patients at the highest risk. So exactly as Dr. Mm -hmm. Gold was able to show with the uh, graphic earlier on, that's why we see a peak of skin cancers really in the 60s, 70s, and 80s due to that cumulative exposure over time. Now, melanoma is a little bit different. Really, any type of sunburn at all will double your risk for developing melanoma, our deadliest type of skin cancer. And we also see that it's intermittent ultraviolet exposure that can put patients at the highest risk. So we see this a lot in our rural and Midwestern patients where we might not get as much sun through the winter time, but then might go on spring break or travel and get blistering sunburns. That's really the highest risk pattern of ultraviolet exposure for, uh, real, for developing melanoma, our deadliest type of skin cancer. So really no such thing as a safe tan, but the great news as Dr. Gold mentioned is unlike a lot of other types of skin cancer, we really can control the amount of ultraviolet exposure that we get going forward. We can't change what's happened in the past, but we can certainly uh, plan on ways to safely be outside and protect our skin from the sun going forward. Now, you also asked about type, skin types and how some patients might be at higher risk than others. You're absolutely right. So we know that patients with light skin, light hair, and light eyes are genetically more susceptible to developing all the types of skin cancer and have less natural protection from the sun in the form of melanin within the skin cells themselves. And so in general, lighter skin, lighter eyes, lighter hair type patients or those uh, with a high number of moles in general are at higher risk for developing skin cancer. It's interesting. 877-731-6733. Dr. Gold, I want to bring you into the conversation because skin cancer is something that we've been able to learn a great deal about in the last 50 years. But before that, I've heard stories of women putting iodine on baby oil and going out and baking in the sun. Now, if we do have some from the baby boomer generation who know exactly what I'm talking about out there, what have we learned and really how has this changed the game for medicine based on the research that we've just had over the past 50 years? Yeah, well, well we've learned a lot of things, Christina, and that is the types of behavior <clears throat> that you just described are set the stage for increasing the risk for skin cancer for those that are simple to treat like uh, basal cell and squamous, but those that are much more complex to treat uh, such as uh, melanoma. You know, and there's been a lot of misinformation, unfortunately, that typical types of skin makeup that many women will apply uh, and think that they're protected uh, to, from uh, the exposure of ultraviolet radiation and sun. In reality, <clears throat> that is no longer the, true, uh, in spite of those perceptions that have been around for a very long time. The good news is, is that we now know that the sun protective factors, the SPF uh, numbers that you can get uh, in the sun uh, screen products are very accurate and have a very, very high degree of protection. So we understand what type of sunlight, particularly which types of ultraviolet radiation cause the aging and cause the risk of skin cancer. And we know through the use of sun sunscreens with high SPF factors, <clears throat> that we can blunt and protect that for a very long period of time. Now, I, you know, I, we need to remind our audience, and I need to remind myself and my family, that just because you put some sunscreen on in the morning doesn't mean that you're good all day, particularly if you're mm -hmm. out in the pool 
or working uh, for the entire day. Indeed, that's the time to look at your watch and say, I need to take a break, maybe get in the shade, and maybe reapply some of those factors before you go out later in the day and do the same thing all over again. And I know how hard that is during planting season, during harvest. Uh, it's particularly hard during calving season uh, as well, uh, when our farmers and ranchers are uh, out there, you know, doing what they need to do to uh, earn a living and put food on the table. Uh, for the rest of our nation. But they can do it safely, and that's the message uh, for our viewers uh, this afternoon. It's so important. You want to preserve your future self. You want to take care of your health in the future right now. And we want you to be safe out there, rural America. We have our first caller tonight. Harriet joins us from New York. Thanks for joining us, Harriet. Go right ahead. Oh, hi. hi. My question is about sunscreens. I mean, I presently use a sunscreen with the zinc oxide, and you know, you always come out looking white like a ghost. So, I, and, and I've seen so many on the market with the other ones that have Avril Benzin, Oxy, whatever you can't pronounce the names of those things. And you read these articles that say, avoid the other sunscreens with harmful chemicals. So, my question to you is, are they, should I be avoiding those, or should I? ditch my zinc oxide and go for something and not look like a ghost. <laughs> well, thanks for calling, Harriet. And that's the kind of question that I am sure Dr. Weissong gets asked all the time because there are many different types of sunscreens, including the zinc oxide, which is a blocking agent, as opposed to others that work through different mechanisms. So, Dr. Weissong, uh, what do you think the best answer for Harriet is? Should she ditch her zinc oxide and not look like a ghost, or should she uh, carry on with what seems to be working for her in New York? Yeah, outstanding question, Harriet, and thank you so much for calling in tonight. I think this is an extremely common question that I get in the office all the time. And as Dr. Gold mentioned at the top of the segment, there are really two major types of sunscreen. So there are the physical blockers like zinc and titanium, and those are the ones that rebound the ultraviolet rays from the sun, and they do an outstanding job. In addition, they also block physical light and so really can prevent all kinds of things, including aging. The chemical sunscreens, and just like you said, they sound like chemicals, uh, they tend to absorb the rays and overall also do an outstanding job, but can um, cause some more irritation to the skin. And there have been some recent reports where people have been more concerned about those being absorbed into the body. I will tell you, I've looked into all the literature extensively and the American Academy of Dermatology would agree with me that all the different types of sunscreen truly are safe for use that are on the market. However, really, I always say the best sunscreen is the one that you're going to use regularly. So the zinc titanium sunscreens, you're absolutely right, can be, you can look a little bit more white like a ghost. However, there are multiple new formulations for zinc titanium or physical blocker sunscreens that are what is called micronized meaning they really should not turn your skin that bright white that we're used to. And there are also tinted physical blocker sunscreens that take that white hue out of the sunscreen and do a fantastic job. So I know a lot of my patients really love and prefer those tinted physical blocker sunscreens with zinc and titanium. So that is one thing I will say, if you are going to use the physical blockers, we recommend utilizing one that has both zinc and titanium to get the full spectrum coverage, as Dr. Gold mentioned, protecting our skin from the harmful UVA as well as UVB uh, ultraviolet radiation. Excellent. Thank you so much for that call, Harriet. That leaves a line open for you tonight, 877-731-6733. Dr. Weissong, I've heard from a number of farmers, one pet peeve that they have is they're out there working in the sun and they're sweating. And once they start to sweat, oftentimes it'll help that sunscreen get into their eyes and it burns, making it distracting yes. to do their job. What would you say to somebody with that concern? 
I think that that is a very real concern. And the wonderful news is there are multiple new formulations for sunscreen in general. Now, I'm going to zoom us out and back up just a little bit. So Dr. Gold mentioned there are lots of ways that we can protect our skin from the sun, and he's absolutely right. Particularly when I'm talking to farmers and other outdoor workers, I like to start first with what we call UPF or ultraviolet protective factor clothing. So there are wonderful, lightweight, breathable fabrics now that have that ultraviolet protection built in. And I strongly encourage our listeners to look into UPF clothing, multiple different our brands now cover UPF clothing. So start with that. We talked about broad brimmed hats or other types of hats that will cover our ears, our face, our neck overall. Sun, uh, sun glasses to of course protect from UVA and UVB and then utilizing sunscreen for anything that's still out and exposed to the sun. Now, specifically, you're absolutely right. The creams and the lotions tend to melt in the sun and can run a little bit. The fantastic news is there are multiple new formulations. My two favorite for outdoor workers are really, um, actually, it's almost like a deodorant and comes in a stick formulation and it rolls on like a deodorant and there's a little bit of a waxy component so it does not melt or run the way that lotion and cream formulations do. And my second favorite formulation that's newer for sunscreen as well is powder-based sunscreen. And it's not only will it not run into your eyes, but it's also a fantastic way to reapply sunscreen throughout the day. And a lot of my patients love the powder sunscreen, particularly women who can layer it throughout the day, almost like a foundational uh, powder to help throughout the day. And so really, that's my, those are my tips about avoiding sunscreen from running in the eyes when you're outdoors for long periods of time. Excellent. This is the first I'm hearing of the powder. I'm definitely going to get on Amazon and get some this evening. You know, what do you say to our ball cap wearing farmers and ranchers out there? And they say, oh, well, I have the SPF protection in my ball cap. But is their face getting all the coverage it needs? With the standard ball cap, the face is not typically getting the coverage it needs, which is why we really do recommend that broad brimmed hat with several inches and really getting the shade protection that you need. And then really anything that's left, I would recommend one of the deodorant style roll on SPFs or really any sunscreen that you're going to utilize regularly because the standard ball cap just won't cut it. Ah, you know, you think you're doing the right thing, but you want to make sure that you have that wide brim. It's so important. And you know what? You're still going to look good in that wide brim hat. Let me tell you right now. John from Wisconsin joins us next. John, thanks for joining us. Go right ahead. John, are you with us? I think we may have lost John, but that's OK. We're going to keep moving on here. Will we someday be able to tell through our genes which of us is most susceptible to skin cancer? Or is this something like Dr. Gold pointed out? It's just one of those things that it's fair game for anybody who worships the sun. I love this question, Christina, because this is one of the most rapidly advancing areas of skin cancer research. I'm very proud to say that our lab here at the University of Nebraska is really on the cutting edge of now starting to understand how genes and genetics play a role in skin cancer. So there are two major types of mutations that we look at when we're talking about skin cancer or really any type of cancer. First is what we call germline mutations, which are mutations that are found in all the cells of the body and are passed down from our parents, and so we inherit them and pass them on. The second major type of genetic mutation that we see is called somatic, or also known as sporadic mutations. And those happen in response to ultraviolet radiation, primarily when we're talking about skin cancer. So we now have increasing evidence that there are both germline mutations are mutations that patients are born with that put them at higher risk for developing skin cancer. 
Some of those are related to the genes that give us our light skin, light hair, light eyes. But also some of those mutations are related to the way that our immune system works and helps to fight off cancer. So we're just at the early stages of understanding how those genes might impact skin cancer. What's extremely exciting is work that's come out of our lab and others looking at those sporadic or somatic mutations that we actually see in the skin cancer cells. Our group helped develop, along with multiple other centers across the country, a new test specifically in squamous cell carcinoma that looks at groups of genes that can predict poor outcomes in skin cancer, and specifically those patients that might benefit from additional testing or treatment, while also identifying patients that don't need extra treatment and can be cured in a local dermatology office. So more and more is happening with gene expression and the way that our genes impact skin cancer. And this is just the beginning. So lots more to come. Oh, I know that if UNMC is on it, that there will be great research, great data coming from everything that you do. And Dr. Gold, you brought another rock star on for us. We have to have you back on the show, Dr. Wysong. We have our next caller now. We are going to Edward from Alabama next. Thanks for joining us, Edward. Go right ahead. And this is just the beginning. All right. You want me to speak now? Yeah, you know what? You might want to step away from your television set because we're getting a little bit of feedback, but you are on with Dr. Okay, Gold and Dr. Wysong. I'll turn it over for you. We have our next caller now. We are. There we go. I'll turn it off. There you go. Am I, re- am I on now? You're on. I beg your pardon? Yep, you're on with Dr. Yes, Weissong Edward, and Dr. Go right Gold. Ahead. <laughs> uh, Dr. Ross, my name is Edward Rice. I'm about 89 years old, and I've lived in uh, South Africa, well, in Africa for up to 50 years. And when you were talking about sunburn, the hat, uh, uh, when we were kids, we didn't wear a wide brim hat. We used to get the stick. I mean, even when you went to school, I think. But one of the things we did generally was we kept our skin damp. With a rag, if you went swimming, you get in the pool and out. If you're out in the sun, you had a wet tanky, you just wiped your body. That, I mean, your arms, what was usually your arms, the arms, the only part that's sort of to the sun at the moment. And that stopped us being sunburned too. We had the other ointments, but this was sort of a simple way, and just for a wet rag, you rubbed your skin, and that was how we did it. What you've been saying has been very interesting. Thank you. Well, thank you for calling, Edward. And uh, I'm sure you had quite an interesting set of experiences uh, growing up in South Africa, I think you said. So uh, I'm not aware of making your skin wet or damp, of having a significant amount of protection from ultraviolet uh, aspects of sunlight and damaging. Indeed, there's any number of uh, experiences that patients, friends, family members have had of serious sunburn uh, while they're swimming or boating uh, uh, and and truly wet. Uh, There's also, of course, the sun exposure that comes from reflected sunlight, either from the water surface or sometimes from snow or ice conditions where there's a lot of reflected sunlight. But let's ask the expert. Let's see what Dr. Weissong thinks as to uh, whether that's a solid recommendation or just what I would put into the uh, category of uh, urban legend. No, you are right on, Dr. Gold. Uh, Edward, thank you for calling and for sharing your experiences in South Africa. We know that there is increased ultraviolet exposure, just like Dr. Gold said, reflecting off of the water, uh, also off of the snow. So in general, if you can dry yourself and get rid of that excess water, we think that that can decrease your ultraviolet exposure. But you're, you're absolutely right, Dr. Gold. It's really that reflective ultraviolet exposure off of water and off of snow that we worry about. And so it's important to stay sun safe in the water and sun safe when we're on the ski slopes for sure. 
Excellent, though. Still sharp as ever. Edward from Alabama at 89 years old. Thank you so much for calling us tonight. That leaves a line open for you. 877-731-6733 is the number to call. We're going to take a quick break, but stay with us. We still have time for your question, comment. Maybe you have a story to share that can help somebody else. We want to hear from you tonight. 877-731-6733. More Rural Health Matters right after this. One minute to post time. Four hundred and forty yards, one million dollars. Don't miss the second leg of the American Quarter Horse Triple Crown at Ruidoso Downs, the Rainbow Derby, live July sixteenth on the Cowboy Channel and streaming on Cowboy Channel Plus with your subscription. Hi, I'm eight-time world champion Donnie Gay. Where can you see my world champion mementos, Trevor Brazil's buckles, and Jay Novacek's Super Bowl ring? The Texas Cowboy Hall of Fame. I'm proud to share a spot with Texas' greatest cowboys, cowgirls, ranchers, artists, and entertainers. Historic wagons, too. Visit the Texas Cowboy Hall of Fame in the historic Fort Worth Stockyards. Live when the markets are open, Market Day Report delivers the agribusiness news, weather, and markets of the day from across the world. Covering what's important to you and your farm, including instant updates on prices that impact your bottom line. You voted RFD-TV is the most trusted source of farm market information for producers. Stream Market Day Report on RFD-TV now or tune in Monday through Friday, 9 a.m. Eastern, 6 a.m. Pacific on RFD-TV. Season seven coming up. Season seven. How to be funny. Got to be funnier. Funnier than the first six. Chicken cross the road. Why did chicken? Why did duck cross the road? Tied to the chicken. The highlights of those keeping America fed. Plus, meet our special guest. All that grain that we're getting, it's like farm to malt house to me in a very short amount of time. Shark Farmer, airing Tuesday nights at 9.30 p.m. Eastern. That's 8.30 Central on RFD TV. Don't miss it. Welcome back to Rural Health Matters. We have an incredibly important topic tonight. We are talking about skin cancer and how to prevent it, more importantly. 877-731-6733 is the number to call and join our conversation. Wallace joins us now from Texas. Thanks for joining us, Wallace. Go right ahead. Thank you for taking my call. Uh, I'm an 83-year-old cattle rancher in central Texas, and I have a question for Dr. Wysong. And that is, I sometimes get sores on my arms that won't heal, and I try different types of medications and Band-Aids. My question is, doc, for Dr. Wysong, is should I go to the doctor, uh, dermatologist, and have these frozen off? And what kind of concerns do I have for the future of these sores on my arms? Well, thank you for calling, Wallace, and I'm sorry to hear about your uh, arm sores. Uh, I'm sure, though, this is the kind of thing that Dr. Wysong uh, gets uh, in her office all the time because people are not only concerned about the fact that these recur, but they're also concerned about the diagnosis. And particularly, does this represent some form of skin cancer? And therefore, does it need a bit more aggressive treatment? So, Dr. Wysong, what would you recommend to Wallace, who's obviously out in the sun a good deal? Thank you so much, Wallace, for your call. And I would definitely agree with Dr. Gold. I think it would be an outstanding idea for you to see your primary care physician or a board certified dermatologist in your area. They are really well trained and can take a look at that, those areas on your arm and if needed, do a biopsy to diagnose it. The great news is if it is a skin cancer, again, there are many ways that we can treat this with minimal downtime and allow you to get healing and back on the cattle ranch as quickly as possible. But anything that's bleeding and not healing, we would absolutely recommend you get in to be seen. Thank you so much for that call, Wallace. That leaves a line open for you, 877-731-6733. Dr. Wysong, I will ask, we're talking about skin cancer. We're talking about prolonged exposure to the sun. But in reality, 
our farmers and ranchers, like Dr. Gold pointed out, you're talking about calving, having to get out there to milk cattle, milk cows, mm -hmm. and, you know, it doesn't matter what the weather is like at times. How do you really get somebody to take it seriously that this is an mm -hmm. imminent threat if you do have that sun exposure for too long over so many years that you're really, you're, you're playing with something that's very, very risky. How do you get them to really wake up and understand that? Because oftentimes we have our gruff farmers and ranchers, they're set in their ways, they've done things a certain style for so long. Is there a method that you have possibly or, or a way that you talk to men and women out there? Great question, Christina. And I think when it comes to all patients and particularly to active outdoor farmers and ranchers, I really like to sit down and get to know my patients and meet them where they really are at. And so sometimes that means understanding what does your typical day-to-day -day look like and what's doable for you. I find oftentimes for my outdoor workers and ranchers, Oftentimes, it's that protective clothing that's really the realistic piece that they can and absolutely will do right away. But you're right. And unfortunately, sometimes, and this is just that human aspect of it, it can be really challenging to take seriously something that may not happen for many, many years to come. I do find that once patients are diagnosed with skin cancers or they've had to go through different treatments or they've seen a loved one go through a cancer diagnosis, uh, that can be a great opportunity to really talk to folks and when people tend to uh, have, a, have a more a listening ear around that. But at the end of the day, I think we need to get to know our patients, meet them where they are, and identify a strategy that will work for them. And we talk about treatment lasers now, often one of the ways that we're able to treat potentially deadly skin cancer we didn't have that capability 50 years from now. So clearly you are able to save more lives at this point in time, but it's still something that we all need to take very seriously. Dr. Gold, do you have any final thoughts for our viewers tonight? You know, I do, Christina, because uh, we deal with patients all the time that we're trying to reduce their risk of cancer or heart disease uh, or neurologic stroke or things of that nature. And frequently, it's not an all or nothing conversation. It's about let's take some steps together to reduce your risk, in this case for skin cancer. Let's try it out for a few months during the upcoming harvest or during the upcoming planting season. See where we are together in a few months. And then let's see if there are other steps that we can take. But I think the most important message for our audience tonight is just awareness and to make our audience realize that there are things that we can all do to protect ourselves from the sun uh, and to live a full and, and, and enjoyable life uh, and to be able to help the next generation, our kids and grandkids, be sure that they're maximally protected as well. So it's never all or nothing. It's always how can we work together and take some steps. And for rural Americans, trying to find a dermatologist, especially in their hometown, can be difficult. What would your guidance be for somebody who does have a questionable mole or freckle even? Well, I would always start with asking your local health care professional to take a look at it because they are very experienced and they do so. Uh, but, you know, there are always referral services that you can get online uh, and others. Okay. What an outstanding and incredibly informative show tonight. I want to thank you both, Dr. Song, Dr. Gold. We'll see you back here next week.